Well, it is great to be with you, and I and, uh, was with your Columbia campus last week, and so thankful for these two Sundays and this time with you. It's really special to me. And uh, if you have your Bibles, go ahead and turn to Mark chapter 1. We're going to focus only there this morning in Mark chapter 1, verse 17. And what, what excites me about that is it's probably a familiar verse to you, but I hope as we walk through it this morning that we cannot let the familiar uh, haunt us a little bit and keep us from really seeing some of the nuances of this, of this particular verse, this invitation that Jesus gives, and, and that we might be reminded. I, I, I told the first gathering, I don't know that I'll say much that will give you an aha moment. I, I think it'll mainly be a reminder. I think you're uh, committed to the mission of God. But I hope that it will at least be an encouragement, a reminder, a challenge to keep at it and to understand that we are not just disciples for Jesus. We're disciple makers with Jesus. And there's a difference. Mark 1.17 Jesus said to them, Follow Me and I will make you become fishers of men. Follow Me and I will make you become fishers of men. Let's pray. Father, thank You. Thank You for inviting us along into what You have always been doing. Help us this morning to just simply be reminded not to let this following You become about me, but to know that I become the fullness of who You're making me to be when I live on mission with You. Thank You for the abundant life that that gives because You've invited us into life giving. And so we surrender this time and this, this opportunity to just process and think about Your Word together. And we pray this in Your name, Jesus. Amen. Catalina is from Colombia. And she lived or moved from Colombia to Miami, from Miami to Orlando. And specifically, not just Orlando, but the west side of Orlando. And we were invited. I was a college pastor with First Baptist Orlando. And then we were invited by the Florida Baptist Convention to start a new church, a new work out on the west side of Orlando. It was a 30,000 acre development that was nothing but orange groves and cow pastures. When we were invited, there were no people in this 30,000 acre development. It just, we became the first church presence within about a 20 minute drive. We were the 59th home built in the first neighborhood, and you could see the Magic Kingdom fireworks, the Mickey Mouse Magic Kingdom fireworks from our backyard. It was one of those unique spaces, and everybody moved there, it seemed like, from everywhere but Central Florida. So many folks from New Jersey, New York, the Midwest, and Columbia and many other places. But Catalina moved in hoping to get a job at Disney. Her, her goal was to be in the hospitality industry, which as you know, Disney has done a fairly good job at that. And so they have 68,000 employees in their Orlando base. And she wanted to become one of them. Her first job, though, was at a Washington Mutual Bank. We opened our bank account for the new church start at that bank. And that was how we first engaged with Catalina, and we were just being ourselves, which was not very pastor-like. We were just cutting up and being silly and joking around. We started cutting up, being silly, joking around with her. I guess she thought we were normal enough that she decided to show up to a Sunday gathering. And then she realized we weren't that normal, at least to her, because she didn't come back to a Sunday gathering for some 15 months. But two women that she met that morning exchanged contact information with Catalina, and Catalina welcomed them into her life 
and they invited her along into their life. And it was 15 months of a journey. It was not quick. It wasn't a one-time conversation. It wasn't someone having the right answers. It was two women who loved Catalina deeply, who served and invited her to serve with them, who ate and invited her to the table with them, who would talk about and study the Word in, a, in the real and in the flow of their everyday life and invited Catalina into those rhythms with her, with them. And over time, Catalina began to see she was searching for who she was, and these are her, her words. But ultimately, she ended up finding not who she was, but whose she was. It was a pretty amazing journey. 15 months in the making. Catalina's brilliant. She knows four different languages. She was not a believer but we were doing some ministry among certain groups there that spoke other languages, and we asked her to come with us and be an interpreter. And she did that consistently. And when she began to believe who she was in Christ, she pointed back at that moment and said, that day, that first time that I got to serve with you, I saw something. And it wasn't just in us. She saw the power of the Gospel. And even as a lost person at that time, someone still finding her way, she saw something and she served with us. And she kept serving with us. And I'll never forget when together we got to baptize her as a new believer. Four years later, Catalina became the head of our women's ministry. We had been challenged that when we would do a new church start, if we were committed to disciple making among the lost and searching, probably the leaders of our church were yet to believe. And I wonder that for you. I wonder that for all the other hopes and dreams that are around us in this ministry that we're a part of. You see, those women though, they caught something. They realized that this wasn't for them. This wasn't just for them. Now, and I don't miss this, we need care and mission together. We need the encouragement of the local church because we as believers, if we are on mission with Jesus, we need to be able to lean back into other believers and encourage each other. But we can't stop there. We don't just need to encourage each other. We need to also provoke each other. In fact, in Hebrews 10, there's two reasons for assembling together. One is encourage. One is provoke. And the word in the Greek, just to encourage all of you, means to irritatingly stimulate. And I'm sure you've felt that way over the years, that that person sitting over there has been quite irritatingly stimulating. But we need that. Because encouragement feels good. Doing this Christian thing for me and my improvement and my moral betterment feels good. But it's not why we've been invited along. We've been invited along not only to discover our identity in Christ, but to help others discover theirs too. And so you and I are not just disciples for Jesus. He's invited us to be disciple makers with Him. And this verse highlights that more than any other. As we look at this verse, I want to point out three aspects of it that I think are are very important in understanding this becoming a disciple-maker with Jesus idea. The first one is this. Becoming disciple-makers with Jesus is our Jesus-initiated invitation. It's our Jesus-initiated invitation. You see, he, he's in this fishing village of Capernaum, and Jesus noticing these men, probably who had been welcoming Him into their life, and, and, and He invites them along with Him. He invites them along. And this word, follow me, it truly is an, it gives the idea in the original language of I'm the one who is up to something and 
I've now taken the initiative to invite you into what I'm up to, into what I'm doing, into what I have always been doing. And so he initiates this idea of followership. He initiates the relationship and he invites them not to something and not just to do something, but along into his life. And in that process, he says, come with me. That's how it can be translated. Come with me. That must be important to God because God named His Son that. God with us. This with God thing must be very meaningful to Him. He's not just asking us to live for Him. He's asking us to live with Him. He's not just asking us to be good for Him. He's asking us to go with Him and to help others see His goodness. He has initiated this. But it's not just that He initiated it when Jesus showed up. He's always been doing this. He initiated this when He made us. He initiated this when He created. Right? I mean, He knew that we as humanity would choose good and evil instead of just His goodness. He knew that. And yet He made us anyway. He knew that, and yet He put a plan in place to put on skin, come, on, come in the middle of us, and take all of that brokenness and burden and selfishness and all of the effect of knowing good and evil upon Himself, expire it on the cross, and then resurrect the life that He had always intended for us, abundant life with Him. He knew He would have to do that. You see, He's a sent God. We're not just His sent people. We follow a sent God. Because Jesus said, as the Father sent Me, now I'm sending you. John 20, 21. He is a sent God. And I would suggest this to you just to hit this home as, 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 as clearly as I can. I would suggest, and it's not original to me, but I would suggest that God's church doesn't have a mission. But God's mission has a church. God's church doesn't have a mission in and of itself. We, we, we don't have this thing that we do. We've been invited into what God is doing. And what He's always been doing. And His mission is much bigger than each of our local churches. That's why we can unite around the Gospel, around Christ, because His mission is what is our purpose. He's called us into something. He has initiated this. You and I didn't deserve it. We're not good enough for it. We don't know enough for it. And yet, He invites us to come with Him. And so I challenge you, are you becoming a disciple maker with Him? Him. I would suggest also, not only is becoming a disciple maker with Jesus our Jesus-initiated invitation, but it is also our Jesus-secured identity. It is also our Jesus-secured identity. Now I want you to catch this. The word that He uses here, follow Me, and I'll make you to become. Follow me and I'll make you to become. Okay? In, in most English translations, for some reason, I don't really know why, we've lost what this, what this verse is saying in the original language. It's not just an evangelistic or a task verse. It's not just an effort verse kind of verse. It isn't just a, yes, so one of the things that you do as a follower is you do evangelism or you do disciple making. It's not that. It's an existence verse. In the original language, the word that's used here is also used in extra-biblical language of the first century as an existence language. This, In other words, it can be translated, follow me and I will make you to exist as. 
God does something in us. He secures something for us. He gives us a name. His name. He, He gives us a purpose. His purpose. He gives us a life. Not our life. His life. And He secures that, invites us into it, and asks us to walk in it. He is making us to become not we ourselves. And that's significant. Because unfortunately, I think a lot of times in the American church, when we talk about discipleship or disciple making even, although there's a significant distinction, a lot of times what we really mean is Christian betterment. I'm going to take some classes and do these things and be accountable to these things and not do these things. And it becomes more about what I do, don't do, and how I'm doing than it does about what Jesus is making me to become. We need to be careful of that. Or else we'll become moralists instead of people who need a Messiah. We need to understand that Christianity is not about personal self-actualization in Christianized form. It is about believing what Jesus has done and is doing and what He secured us to do with Him. And abundant life and our sinfulness and our gratefulness and all of the things that we want to grow in, even our knowledge of the Scriptures, will grow and will come as we go with Him. We won't be good enough to go. He's just invited us to go. We won't know enough to go. He's just asked us to come and learn. We won't ever feel worthy enough to go. He is the only one who is worthy enough. And He's invited us to have His worth as we go. You see, for these men, it was really interesting because you know as well as I do that they were not educated men. They were not a people who uh, knew a ton. They certainly weren't worthy enough. They were rough around the edges. Some of them were more passionate about their own causes than Jesus' cause. Some of them were more passionate about being elevated in His kingdom than Him being elevated in His kingdom. Some of them had, they were, they had many different issues and many different insecurities. And yet, early on in Matthew 16, He tosses the keys to the kingdom to them. In Matthew 10, He had just invited them. And He sends them, even as a lost and believing people. These men, He secured them and made them who they needed to be in His mission. Now, it's important because for a lot of us, We've already been given a name and an identity and a purpose and we don't walk in it because we don't think we have identified enough with it or become worthy enough of that name. Or, but we've got to understand, that's not believing in what Jesus is making us to become. That's trying to make a name for ourselves. And I don't want to belittle the fears and insecurities that we all have. I have them too. Just because I have a title of multiplication minister doesn't mean I don't get serious nervousness or butterflies or or, or wonderings or fear when I get into moments where it's clear that I have an opportunity to share the Gospel with someone. But for some reason, because of our fears and insecurities or our doubts or our not feeling good enough, We don't engage in disciple-making with Jesus the way that He's asked us to. And I want to encourage you this morning. Maybe the key to engaging in being a disciple-maker with Jesus has more to do with remembering whose you are and the identity that's already been secured for you than it does trying to figure out the best three tactics uh, for the ways to share the Gospel. Remember what the cross has already done. Remember what it's already said of you. Because of the cross of Jesus, even on my worst day, I'm still Jason Dukes in Christ. And I'll never know enough. And I'll never be good enough. But I can go with the One who decided to give me His goodness. I'm secure. 
you have been secured. And not just for your own betterment or your own happiness, but so that you can now give what's been given to you to someone else. It's our Jesus-secured identity that should provoke and compel us to be disciple-makers with Jesus. And then finally, not only does becoming disciple-makers with Jesus, not only is it our Jesus-initiated invitation, and not only is it our Jesus-secured identity, but it's also our Jesus-defined purpose. His invitation to us and the identity that He gives to us, it should define what our everyday looks like. So for these fishermen, it made them into fishers of men. I would imagine that if he had been talking to bankers or to Matthew even at this time as a tax collector, that he might have said, follow me and I'll make you to become an investor in people. Or a teacher, he might have said, follow me and I'll make you to become someone who helps others learn while they learn with you. Follow me if you're a garbage man and I'll help you to become someone who helps others understand the trash that I've taken out in their life and how I've cleaned them up and they didn't have to clean themselves up first. They could come to me. Follow me if you're an attorney. Well, I'm not sure about that one. That's a joke. It's a joke. It's a joke. I love attorneys. All right. But here's the deal. Right? Our every day should look different if we are followers of Jesus. And I'm not talking about our everyday behavior. I, I think we need to understand that the lost and searching around us, we don't need to call them to moralistic behavior. We need to call to the Messiah who took all of the immoral behavior of our world and nailed it to a cross. So I, if I'm going to only make disciples of moralism, that's not what Jesus is making me to become. I need to make sure I am also inviting the lost and searching into my own issues and brokenness and how the Gospel is coming to bear on it. I need to understand that my everyday isn't just about my behavior. It's about the intentionality with which I see the people around me, do I see them as though they already by the cross of Jesus have been saved and given a new name and i am simply been sent there to ask them, did you know this has happened and will you believe? I need to see them welcoming me into, my, into their lives and knowing that when they welcome us into their lives, those who are lost and searching, that it's a chance for us to invite them along into our life. I want you to process this with me. I would suggest to you that Jesus had two very specific rhythms and a practice that defined His every day. Two very specific rhythms and a certain practice that defined His every day. The first thing is I would suggest he served consistently. Now don't hear this as another sermon, someone trying to guilt you into the obligation of serving, because I think what we've done for a long time is let serving kind of lie off over on its own over here and made it this duty that we should do as Christians. And that's not what it is. Because I think to Jesus, serving was framed inside of disciple making. I would suggest to you that Jesus served consistently enough to invite people along to serve with Him. Specifically, people who had yet to believe. Because these twelve men did not. They had yet to believe when He invited them along to serve with Him and when He sent them to serve themselves. And some came back and stuff was going well. Others came back and it wasn't going well. And He coached them and He poured into them. And this rhythm of serving then was not just about the needs of the people that He served. He served also for the sake of the twelve men that He invited along to serve with Him. So whether it's local and global, who are the lost and searching that you're inviting along to serve with you? 
The second rhythm that I think he had, and this one's tough. I mean, it's, it's, this one you're probably going to need to take classes on. It was eating. That was a joke. It may have been a bad joke. But you don't have to do much equipping for that. You don't have to do much equipping for that. We all eat. And it's funny because nobody ever preaches on the verse in Luke 7, I think it is, where, where it says that the Son of Man came eating and drinking. I mean, this was an intentional tactic for Jesus. He, he didn't just do it to target people. He did it because He loved people. And you and I both know that when you sit around a meal with people, conversation happens. Life comes out. Whether it's our, 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 our victories or our brokenness. Whatever it is. And it must have been His habit because in, the Emmaus situ- in that Emmaus moment, when those two men recognized Him, it was when He broke bread. He ate with people. He served with them and He ate with them. And He served with them and He ate with them. And He served with them and He ate with them. And that practice was inviting along the lost and searching to serve with Him and eat with Him. And in so doing, they learned the Kingdom of God and the Gospel of Jesus. Who are you among the lost and searching, who are you inviting along to eat with you on a regular basis such that they can see how you are allowing the Gospel to speak into your own brokenness and your own insecurities so that they might discover how it speaks into theirs too. Eating and serving and inviting along. You see, you don't have to necessarily surrender to becoming a pastor or a missionary. You just may have to surrender the intentionality of what your everyday looks like. You just may have to surrender the motivation of why you get up in the morning and go to work. And let it be to put on Gospel glasses that allow you to see the people that are welcoming you into their life. And then you can invite them along into yours. I had the privilege one time of speaking in in Phoenix, Arizona. And when I did, to be candid with you, it was one of those in and out moments. It was in the course of of a particular event at the Southern Baptist Convention. And... Uh, I spoke at it, and they, uh, we were ushered out, and I don't even think I spoke to anyone. But a year later, I spoke to a lady who, uh, in Florida who came up to me, and she said, hey, I heard you speak last year at Phoenix, which shocked me because I didn't talk to anybody that last year, right? And she said, no, I want you to know what my last year has looked like. And she said, I want you to know I'm, I'm 76 years old, I'm 76 years old, and my last year has been the best year of my walk with Christ. And so I I, I was like, wow, tell me about it. She said, well, I realized that for 26 years, I had been driving past all of my neighbors and all of the people around me and the people I worked with to go 45 minutes away to gather with a church family that I just loved what we did on Sunday morning, but I didn't know any of my neighbors. I didn't, I didn't have a relationship with any of the people that I worked with. It was, it was kind of a go home or go to work, come home. Go to work, come back, don't know your neighbors. I'm going to go drive, do two Bible studies 45 minutes away, do Sunday morning 45 minutes away. She said, I decided to change that. And she said, I want you to know, I discovered that one of my other neighbors is a Christ follower and that she gathers with the local church about four minutes away, that, that gathers four minutes away that, at that church building. And I also have discovered two or three of my other neighbors. One of them is a Jewish Wicca. And I'm already tearing up with her a little bit at this point, but I had to stop and chuckle because I was like, does that even exist? And she said, I've got best friends now who don't even know who they are in Christ yet. 
And I, 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 I thought I knew what abundant life was, but I've discovered in the last year what it is. And I just said to her, what do you think the difference was? She said, I decided to make disciples with Jesus right where I was. I want to challenge you. You and I aren't called to just become better disciples for Jesus. You and I are are made, invited along, identified, purposed to become disciple makers with Jesus. Jesus. Who, who are you inviting along? In the coming year or two, don't get overwhelmed. What if this morning you simply committed and said, Jesus, I beg you, help me just to make one disciple with you, one, over the next two years. Help me to look and see who's welcoming in, me into their life Let me invite them along into my life as I walk with you, as I serve with you, as I eat with you. And let's discover the Gospel and the Kingdom together. We were made, invited along, identified and purposed to become disciple-makers with Jesus. May we do that. Let's pray. Father, thank You that You've always been up to something. This inviting along, this wanting to give Your love and invite others into it. Give us wisdom on how to be faithful to the ways that You are inviting us into that, to the ways that You have identified us and secured us for that to the ways that You give us our purpose in the everyday for that. I pray and I beg You, Jesus, that each of us, You would help us to make disciples with You. We pray this in Your name. Amen.